morning, good morning. Good morning, church. How is everybody? Woo! Happy, happy Sunday. I tell you what, this is a way to start worship. We're going to be baptizing three awesome, wonderful young men this morning. And uh, we're going to begin with Cademan. Cademan, come on in, my friend. This is Cademan Holland. Yeah, give him a hand. We applaud his bold faith. You all know his mom and dad and lots of family members here. And uh, we just love this guy. We have been watching him for a while. He's, he is showing signs. I'm not trying to put any pressure on him, not too much. But he is showing signs of God's call on his life to go into the ministry. And uh, this is a real hard part for pastors because we just want to like, come on, we're going to seminary today. Let's go, you know, do that. But we can't do that. We got to make sure that, you know, this is, this is God's calling on his life. But we're excited. I never thought I would quote Chancellor Palpatine, but we shall watch you with great anticipation. And we shall, <laughs> we shall see what the Lord does with you. And Cayman, it is an honor to uh, not only be your friend, your brother, and your pastor, but to baptize you this morning is, uh, is just awesome. And your family, this will be something you remember the rest of your life. All right, here, take a step backwards with me here, and we'll do this based on your profession of faith and your love for the Lord that is obvious. It is my joy and my privilege to baptize you this morning, your pastor and your brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Love you, buddy. Good job. Amen. Congratulations. That's awesome. All right, Nate. Come on in, my friend. Y'all, this is Nate Banks. Give him a hand. Let him know you love him. Got it? Fantastic. All right. You want to step down, or you think it'll already baptize you? You want to do it? All right, here, let's try it. Let's go. Make sure your head stays above water. You good? Yeah? Woo, doesn't that feel good? I love the Banks. If you haven't met them yet, they're kind of, they're kind of quiet and, until you get to know them. These are awesome family. You got to, you got to get to know them. This is Nate, and uh, just an awesome, awesome young man. When you get to, to, to be around him, you see his love for Jesus. And Nate, just like we said with, with you saw Cayman a minute ago, it is a joy today. I hope you remember this the rest of your life. And the love you have for Jesus, may it carry and burn bright, carry you all the days of your life. It is my joy today to baptize you as your pastor, your brother, and your friend. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. <laughs> yep, Amen. Congratulations, bud. Proud of you. Good job, I Love you. All right. Come on, Spider-Man. Here we go. Got it? Okay. All right. He's so shy. So shy. If you don't know, this is Milo. This is my son. And uh, we, are, we are proud. We were up here last night. We were testing the waters. And he's been talking about his faith. And he came to faith in Jesus at a young age. And he started asking some questions. He said, Dad, I... I remember coming to know Jesus, but can we just settle it once and for all? Can we make sure, and, and I want to be pure, and I want to I publicly say, separate my old life from my new life. And I said, buddy, we absolutely can take care of that. If you have any doubts at all, Pastor Steve, who started this church, once said, if he could be baptized every Sunday, he would do it. Just as a show of faith saying, I want everyone to know whose side I'm on. And I am symbolically saying, devil, you have no hold on me. I am a new creation. So Milo, I love you, buddy. It is my joy to baptize you, your dad, your brother, and your pastor. And I do so this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Got it, buddy? Good job, bud. Proud of you. Whew. That's awesome. I'm going to stay in here for a while because we had refit yesterday morning. And this is actually therapy for my muscles that are hurting in places I didn't know I had. So uh, it was awesome. We had 70 people show up for that. Seriously, it was fantastic. God is up to something, um, and, and I'm so excited to see what God does today. Let's continue our worship. Would you bow with me? Father, we are just so excited about all you do. We give you all credit, all glory, all honor. It is all you. If anyone sees anything in us, God, may it be something awesome, a reflection of you. And Lord, as we continue to worship this morning, may we sing these songs with passion. May we get to your throne and worship and just kneel before you. Father, I pray that you would inhabit our praises and that it would be pleasing in your sight. We love you. You are why we've come. We sing, we worship, we give you it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew. Awesome. Awesome. I hope that sunk in. We are no longer bound in chains. That is awesome, and that is good news, and that is exactly what we talk about 
Because when God comes in our hearts and gives us a reset, oh, it is on. It is on, like Donkey Kong playing ping pong in Hong Kong, okay? It is, it is on, and uh, I am so fired up with what God is doing in this church. It is, uh, it is all him. He gets all the credit and the glory. Today, as we share this, this passage of Scripture in Mark, we're going to look at a, a really cool story. Uh, it's actually a very creepy story, and uh, something that's going to be very, very powerful. And I want to start by sharing a very painful experience once again with you. Uh, displaying my incredible mechanical skills. And uh, it began mowing the lawn. And uh, why are you laughing already? That shouldn't be funny yet. That shouldn't be. And I'm pushing this $99 used Goodwill mower across the, and it's starting to sputter. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, I'm thinking, oh, the grass is high. I did, I played the game, right? Kind of lift it up, go forward, and then try to chop the grass, come back. But that wasn't it, because I had mowed the lawn like a month ago, so I knew it couldn't have been that. And I'm going, and I'm thinking, this is not right. It's like, it just needs a reset. And I'm like, I know how to do this. So I leave it running. (laughs) Mistake number one. And I come over, and I start staring at it, because that's what all good guys do. They stare at equipment. And I was just hoping for some inspiration, and none came. I, I could identify the gas thing. And I think an oil thing, and that was about it. And I saw something sticking out the back. And I was like, I think I know what this is. I have a picture of it right here. This is called a spark plug. See this right here? This little piece of rubber is supposed to be on this, especially when it's running. (laughs) I hadn't even told you yet. So I go over, and I'm like, oh, that thing, the C-clamp the little circle thing, was not securely fastened. When it was touching, it would bounce onto the spark plug, and it would rev up, like, all right, now, and then it would fall away, and then it would fall back. I'm like, oh, we just need to put this back on the little stub thingy, on the spark plug. So I reach down while it's running, <laughs> grab that thing, no problem yet, and I go to put it on the spark plug. <laughs> Y'all... When I regain consciousness, <laughs> my safety goggles were in a tree in my neighbor's yard, and the gum I had been choosing was, was on my windshield, okay? It was, I, it, words cannot describe the shock that I got from that, and the, the pain, and the, so the next thing I did when I came to, is I did what all good guys do, I, I quickly looked around to see if anyone had seen this, and, and when no one had... I turned the mower off, (laughs) and I reset that C-clamp onto the little stubby thing. Fired it back up, and that thing purred like a kitten. Oh, it was so awesome because it had been properly reset. And that's what we need. Last week, we looked at the reset of the heart. Today, we look at the reset of the mind. Church, this is huge. This is where the battles are. You know that? This is where the enemy comes, because if you're already a Christian, the Holy Spirit has sealed you for the day of redemption, he can't get that. The devil can't get that. He can't. He can't even possess you. He can oppress you. He can kind of throw darts your way and whisper to your mind and stuff, but he, he doesn't own you anymore. Your chains are gone. So now the battle moves to the mind and how to have the mind of Christ and how to live like a follower of Jesus in a dark world, in a world that really doesn't care, because there is a battle raging here, and it is going on night and day. It is critical we know how to win this battle, how to let Jesus reset our mind, because the struggle begins very, very uh, deceptively. It becomes like a whisper, just a a dark thought, like, you're you're never going to beat that habit. That sin, that sin will always dominate you. Or, you're kind of worthless, you're not doing much, you're just, you're impacted, you know, just, why don't you just go on the sidelines? It begins with a dark thought, or maybe a, a thought of doubt, or maybe it's a whisper of, hate, or greed, or lust, or something. Maybe it's just a dark thought that races through your mind. You're like, where did that come from? What, what is that? That is why it is so important, because it is like the devil, his goal is to launch an evil army at you, just to get your mind off track, just to make you feel a little chaotic, just to get you away from walking in victory. He will send these things, and, and he will try to pick a fight with you in your mind and plant these little whispers in your heart. And guess what? Jesus shows up, and Jesus says, <laughs> bring it on. Bring it on. Because when Jesus walks into a room, every dark thought must bow. 
Everything must bow to the authority of Jesus. Do we claim the authority we have? Do we really walk in that, in that victory? Or do we kind of walk around with the shoulders slumped and, oh, it's just going to be a bad day. This is just, I'm resigned. This is my fate. And so, well, you know, does it, does, it, does it have to be? Does it ha- is, is, it, is it an issue of sin? Is there, is there a chain that needs to be broken? Because Jesus does that. Every dark thought must bow to him when we take it captive. As 2 Corinthians says, when we make it a captive thought, submit it under the authority of Christ. The story we're going to look at is in Mark chapter 5, where we see this played out in a graphic way, in a very creepy way. Go ahead and open your Bibles. Turn in your, your favorite Bible app. Let me welcome those who are streaming. We have an online campus that is growing every week, and we want to welcome you. Thank you for tuning in. Mark chapter 5, we're going to look at the first uh, 15, 20 verses. We're going to stop along the way and, and really dive into the scripture here. All right, everybody got it? I'll put it up on the screen. You can follow along too. And it says this. This is, this is where it says they came out. This is the disciples, by the way, okay? And they come over, and they're about to meet a demon-possessed, freaky, scary, creepy madman, all right? And he says this. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, he's capitalized, that's Jesus, okay? Immediately met him there out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles had been broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains, and he was in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with sharp stones. What? What? Y'all, that's messed up. Can we just be honest? That is... Part of my heart goes out to this guy, right? We have sympathy. We're like, what a poor guy. I mean, he's got he's got an unclean spirit. He's just, I mean, the poor guy, he's living in a graveyard and he's kind of crazed and half naked and he's running around. And part of me says, I have pity on him. But the other part of me, let's be honest, says, that guy scares me, right? We see him, we'd be like, stranger danger, back off, right? Like, you know, if you were walking to Walmart, and you had your kids in hand, and you saw a half-naked crazy man running in circles, yelling and stuff. You know, don't look at me, righteous. You would grab your kids, and you take a step back. Or you're like, you know what? We're going to find another entrance to Walmart, kids. You come over here, and you'd say, listen, I want to I tell you something. Y'all just don't look. Just look at me. Don't look now. But behind you is a crazy naked dude. And he's running in circles, and he's foaming, and he's yelling things. And he's, I think he's got some sharp stones, and he's cutting himself right now. And it's a little freaky. But I just wanted to get, I want you guys, we're just going to back away slowly. And I want to tell you something. Milo, when you play too much Minecraft and you don't eat your vegetables, that's what happens. <laughs> that's what happens, okay? All right? And Marin, I want you to get a mental picture of this. Because when your mom and I promised that we would help you pick the perfect man to marry, that's what we're trying to avoid, okay? That guy right there. You get a mental picture. And you take your kids and you walk away. You know you would. You wouldn't be like, let's go see what this guy is about. Let's go. And that's kind of what the people were like. It was was really, really bizarre to see this guy, but that's not the bizarre part. What's bizarre is what this crazy madman does next. Now, you think demon, and he's going to come up. He's going to see Jesus in a second. So he's going to run up, and he's going to attack Jesus. He's going to come, and he's just going to start wailing on him, and Jesus is going to use the force, and he's going to push him back. He's going to... None of that. Just the opposite happens. He says, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. What? The original language says he he took a posture of of subjugation to Jesus. Okay? We haven't even gotten to really what's inside this guy. You're going to see this in a second. And he cried out. This is the demon-possessed man. He cried out with a loud voice and says, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? The demons in him recognized Jesus and his authority, and they couldn't help but worship him. Think about it. They didn't attack him. They didn't be like, oh, you know, they, were, they didn't give him like, you know, any of that. They just, they just bowed. They said, why are you here? We implore you. Don't, don't torment us before the appointed time. They knew what's coming. And they said, they, don't, don't torment us before the appointed time. And Jesus says, come out of that man, unclean spirit. And then Jesus says, what is your name? And he answered him saying, my name is Legion. For we are many. You know what the, the message says? It says, my name is Mob, for I am a rioting mob. 
Look at this. Notice something bizarre here. He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Anybody notice something bizarre about that? The, the singular and the plural? Y'all, this is frightening. This demon spoke with one voice. Even though we're about to see a legion in Roman times was 6,000 troops. And this guy had a party going on inside him. 6,000 demonic, unclean spirits are inside him. At least, that's what we know of, if, if we're using the term legion here correctly, of the Roman times. But they replied with one voice. Evil has one voice. The devil knows. He's organized. We think, oh, he's just kind of... No, no. He's a counterfeit. And he's a copycat. And he loves to emulate God the Father. Remember, he has the unholy trinity. The false prophet. The, the antichrist. Satan himself, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. They, they, he, all he does is copy. He doesn't have an original thought. Remember, he says, I want to be like the Most High. That's what got him kicked out of heaven, his pride. He said, I will be like the Most High. He didn't say, I'm better than God. He said, I, I want to be like that. And he had this pride. And he had this covetousness. The evil spoke with one voice. He said, my name is Mob because I am a rioting mob. But this mob, for that moment in time, knelt down in subjugation to the authority of Christ. And you know the rest of the story. There's a herd of pigs nearby. And they say, can you just send us into the pigs? Don't destroy us. Don't send us into the bottomless pit. Don't, 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 don't do anything. And Jesus says, boom, go. They go to the pigs, and the pigs freak out. They run down a cliff, over the hill, drown in the sea. They all die. Now, guess what happens next? The crowd hears about this. and like, what? We got to go see this. This is a big deal. You know, WRL's there, and they got the, you know, and everybody's looking, and they wanna, it's, a, it, it's a buzz. And they show up, and for a minute, they're impressed. They're actually impressed with Jesus. They're like, wow, this is great. They had to see this amazing thing. And then five minutes later, they're mad. And they tell him, get out of town, leave. The people showed up and they see that this man is in his right mind. He's dressed. He's sitting there. He's talking normally. They come up, and I love how the message translates. It says, they come up to Jesus and they saw the madman sitting there wearing decent clothes, making sense, and no longer a walking madhouse of a man. At first, the crowd was in awe. Then they're upset. They were impressed five minutes ago. Now they're mad and they're angry. Why? Because they cared more about pigs than they did about this man's eternal health. This guy was just delivered. They couldn't care less. Like, these are pigs. Y'all, I'm, I'm just going to go there. There are people who think humankind created in God's image are equal with animal kind. And think that they have the same rights. God didn't die for the pig. God sent his son. We bear his image. We are, I know PETA's going to send me emails tomorrow, and I'm so sorry. I, listen, I love animals. I love animals. They're delicious. They are, they are, they are, what, you know what I'm saying? I do. I am an animal lover. I really am. But y'all, we get, whew, we get things so twisted up when the life of a pig comes before the health and the eternal salvation of this man. Do you know what I'm saying? Is, is anybody with me? I mean, listen, I love I have dogs and cats, and I love them. They slept with me in my bed and stuff. Now it's mercy that sleeps between us, and we ain't getting any sleep. And I'm not bitter. And this is one of those things that we got we to gotta look at what God says, and we're made it in his image. The crowd was in awe. And then it goes on to say, Jesus gets in the boat, and the demon-possessed guy chases him. He comes up to him, and he says, please let me go with you. He begs him, it says. And Jesus, he has compassion on him. He says, no, I have a better idea. I want you to go home now. Go be with your family and tell them what the Lord has done. Tell them that he had compassion on you and tell them all the wonderful things the Lord has done and how he had mercy on you. So he agrees, and he goes back to the 10 towns, and he starts preaching. And it is unbelievable what happens. In fact, the message says, he was the talk of the town. Don't you love that? You know he was. Was this the crazy dude that used to walk around the Walmart naked, cutting himself, and he's here teaching a theology class? This is he was the talk in the town, and this, this is so amazing. And We see that he was described a minute ago as a madhouse of a man, and now he's no longer that. What a great description. Now let's bring it to us. Have you ever felt like a walking madhouse of a man or a walking madhouse of a woman or a teenager? Because if we're honest, sometimes when things go wrong or things pile up and that stress starts getting to us, sometimes we go a little crazy. It's okay. I've been there. Sometimes we get, you know, when you see it driving down the road and that car cuts you off and my kids see it, they see that look in my eye and they know, just back away. Just leave him alone. He'll, he'll get out you know, and they'll, they'll pet my arm. 
calm me down. And we get that way, just maybe just a little bit. Sometimes you feel like things are just a little bit out of control in your life, a little chaotic, just maybe just a little bit. Is it just me? Okay, all right, a few of you are with me there. Here's, here's what we have to remember. Notice what the madman does. It says that he saw Jesus walking from afar, and he does something unexpected. While he was a long way off, he ran and he bowed in worship before him. Don't miss this. Despite how he was feeling in his mind, the craziness that was going on, the madhouse he was, he was dealing with, and he was, and it affected his life, his heart, his body, the way he came across, he rushed toward the Messiah, not from. When you're having your bad day, when your mind is a madhouse, when those thoughts are coming and you're depressed, what is your natural inclination? Is it to run to the Lord, to the one who can help? Or is it to run from it and huddle in isolation? Because a lot of times we pick the wrong path. Why do we do that? Because the devil wants you to do that. If he can isolate you and get you to think you're the only one dealing with this, you're it. Man, you are such a dork. I can't believe you're dealing. You're the only one. You call yourself a Christian? Are you kidding me? You are worthless. You see how this builds? Man, I got family members and friends who are dealing with just this right here, who, who have bought into the lies, and they hear the enemy come up and whisper these lies to you. It's worthless. Give up. And until we rush towards Jesus and say, I can't do this. I cannot fix this apart from you. Until we come to that, we will continue to lose the war that is waging in our minds. We will continue to need a reset. So there's good news and there's bad news. You know there always is. We'll start with the bad news. The bad news is this. Until we recognize the lies, we will continue to believe them. Count on it. You can write it down. Until we know the lies from the enemy are coming, you don't even, you're oblivious. There's no way you can fight them. But here's the good part. Here's the great news about this. Once we recognize the lies, we no longer have to believe them. You don't have to listen to them. You don't have to entertain them. And I'm going to show you from Scripture right here three amazing gems. I mean glittering gems of how to reset and have Christ reset our mind. When he comes and whispers that things are helpless and hopeless and unbearable, and then he tries to slip the ultimate lie to you, why don't you just give up? You will have a way to fight back. Because when he whispers, why don't you give up? Jesus is walking by that graveyard in that moment. And he says, hey, don't give up, man. I have a better way. Psst, follow me. And he reveals some amazing gems right here. They're so profound. When I share the first one, you're going to think you know this. And you're going to think you live this. But I don't think we do. I don't think we really grasp this. Are you ready? It's so simple, some of us are going to miss it. I'll give you a warning. You ready? We can only think one thought at a time. We can only think one thought at a time. We can think multiple thoughts in rapid succession, but we can only think. Have you, have you realized this? No matter how savvy you think you are, no matter how great a multitasker you are, how many things you can juggle, it's not about that. Here's a test. If I were to say, for the next five minutes, do not, under any circumstances, think about a giant white elephant. <laughs> Within five minutes, every hand would go up in this room when you have thought of a white elephant. Because you're telling yourself, don't think about a white elephant, don't think about a white I just thought about a white elephant. Because our mind is built by God to focus on one thing at a time. It is impossible for you not to think about that white elephant. You will think about one thing at a time. Church, this is so powerful. Think about the implications here. This is so, if you and I are thinking a noble thought, then we cannot be thinking simultaneously an evil thought. Let that sink in. If we are thinking a noble thought, a thought that is pure, a life-giving thought, then we can't be thinking a life-draining thought. If we are thinking a thought that is pure, we can't be thinking a thought at the same time that is impure. It is physically impossible, and the devil knows this. Certainly, the Lord knows this because he's showing this. If you're the young, single mom, let's say you're coming from Holly Springs, and you, for the first time, are starting to feel that you just might be worth something, then that lady at that same moment cannot be thinking right then that she is worthless. You see how powerful this is? If that man who is a French fry loving, cheese curd eating guy who's got out of control diabetes sitting there in Texas, and he suddenly thinks maybe healthy living isn't out of reach, then for that moment, he is not hopeless. For that moment, he feels that healthy living could just be. He's not doomed forever to disease. If that wife in the car heading to that AA meeting driving, 
just heard on the radio that there is hope, a living hope that can be found because of the resurrection of Jesus, then in that moment, she's thinking hope, her life isn't hopeless. You see that? Now, she could think both thoughts, absolutely. She just can't think them at the same time. If you get this, this will set you free like the chains being broken we just sang about. This leads to the second thing, the most amazing part of this, okay? You got the first step. The second gem is choose then for that one thought to think something noble. Oh, this is so good. All right, listen to what Paul said to the church at Philippi. We'll read it together. He says, finally, my brothers, when you think of something, think of whatever is true. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why did Paul say that? Because he knew the secret. He knew the battle of the mind. He knew that if he's thinking something true and noble and right and pure, he is not dwelling on something that is dark. He knows that. He knows the, the battle going on. He knows that the mind is not a vacuum. It will dwell on something. You know it will. When you're laying in bed at night, can you ever shut your mind off and put it in neutral? I'm just going to think about nothing for a minute. No, good luck. You can't do it. The devil knows that. And he comes and he says, think about this. Think about that. This is, take your thought life captive is what Paul's saying. Take it, Com commit it, and subject it to the obedience of Christ. You seize those thoughts. Don't let un unmanned thoughts come roaming through your mind unattended. That's dangerous. You know where that goes. It only escalates to a darker path. Demand that they comply and lock it down. You are in charge of what's in here. An unlocked building is an unsecure building. It is no good. Let me show you what I mean. I was up here working late one night. Everyone had gone home, and all the lights were off except the one in my office. My office door was still open. Light was spilling into the hallway, and I could see five feet. I'm sitting there typing away, making great progress, and all of a sudden, whoosh, by my door. At first, I would say my hair stood up, but I don't have any. At first, I sit up, and I kind of look. I'm like, did I just? Well, that was strange. And I go back to typing. A few seconds later, whoosh, again. A massive, dark form goes by my doorway. Now, it's getting dark. All I can see is about five feet. I'm standing up, and I'm like, there's somebody in here. So I bravely walk to the door, poke my head out, and I'm looking both ways. And I, you, you ever feel like you're being watched? Like, like you just feel, before you even sense, you just know, somebody's in here? I look down this hall, and I turn, and when I turn, I slam into a giant, dark-clothed man. You want to talk about freaked out. This guy was big. I mean, like, I'm looking up to him, and he had something in his hand. And he went to reach and hand. You know what it was? It was a UPS package. It was a UPS guy dressed in dark brown. <laughs> I felt kind of foolish. And I looked at him, and I said, can I ask you something, sir, <laughs> big man? How did you get in here? You know what he said? Get this. This is so spiritually deep, y'all. He said, we do this for a living. All we do is we go around and we look for the door that you forgot about. We look for the door that you left open. And we come in. Our job is to deliver. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding he found the one door that had been left unlocked in this building. I, don't, I still don't know which one it was, but he came in. He, man, that, that's not a perfect spiritual illustration for us. The devil looking for the one door you thought you locked, but you left it open. And he came in, and man, that guy, whew, he scared the hair off of me. I was looking up at this guy, and I'm thinking, how did he get in here? I thought I was safe. An unlocked building is an unsecure building. And an unsecure mind is fertile ground for the devil. You can only think one thought at a time. So choose for that one thought to make it a noble thought, to make it a pure thought, a lovely thought. Only you can do this. Are you serious about victory in your mind? Are you serious about having him reset it? Paul's giving you the formula right here. Then he goes on and he says, because Jesus wants to reset our minds, he wants us to think pure thoughts. Starts like, you are loved. You are worth something. You can be forgiven. You are not irredeemable. 
You're not worthless. Don't listen to the lies. Jesus knows if he can reset our thinking, if we can internalize this truth, we will change our world, and then we can change the world. Let me say it again. When we start to internalize his truth, we can change the world. That is powerful. Now do you see why it's so important to reset the mind? Here's the payoff. I haven't even gotten to the good part. We are priceless. We are creations made in the image of the Most High God. And when we start to grasp that, we start treating others the same way. Let me put it another way. Once we start grasping this, we will often treat others the way we feel about ourselves. That's a mirror. You ever meet someone who's bitter, who's unhappy with everything? And they're unhappy with themselves. You know they are. You know they are. We don't shun them, man. We got to love those people. They need that. If we are richly blessed, if we are divinely purposed, if we are loved insanely and irrationally, you don't think that'll affect how you view your neighbor? Absolutely. It'll overflow and people will see you and go, man, I want some of that, please. What is different about you? And it is incredible. And if, this, if we start thinking just that one thought, I matter to God. Hope is not lost. I am victorious. These truths will change your mind. It will start to saturate yourself like a, like a holy hot shower here. This, I love this picture here. It's like this, this water just pouring down is how I picture scripture. Just like a holy hot shower, kind of like I'm drenched with sweat right now. I just want to sling it up there. It's just one of those things that is just that saturating mind, the scriptures, and I'm thinking a pure thought. I'm thinking a noble thought. I'm thinking a praiseworthy thought. And it's one of those, those times where I just feel like I'm so close to God, I can reach out and touch his face. And now what you want, Jesus knows this. I haven't even given you the best part. Let's recap. Step one, you can only think one thing at a time. Gem number two, if you can only think then one thing, think a noble thought. Here's the best part. This is, this is so good. Here's, here's gem number three for you. After you think that first good thought, think another one. Think two pure and noble thoughts in a row back to back. I dare you. I dare you because... This is the beginning of resetting your mind. This is the beginning of what it means to pray without ceasing, to hide the scriptures in your heart, to think about something, to where I am not going to leave room for you, devil, to come into my mind and drop your clutter. Billy Graham says this, if you fill up your Jesus tank in your mind every day, and you do this day by day, you will have reserves to draw from. When that storm comes your way, you won't be left floundering without an anchor. You will recall scriptures. And you will say, that. some of you know this, if you've been raised in vacation Bible school and you've been in a, in a children's program as awesome as ours that brings them up in the admonition of the Lord, and man, they're quoting scripture. I'll be sitting there eating, all of a sudden Milo's quoting scripture. I'm like, where did this come from? This is crazy. Because they've hidden it in their heart. And you know it because you've done it too. This is powerful stuff. If you fill your mind with God's truth, then true thoughts will come to your mind as you go about your day. Some of you can testify that this is true. Now here's, here's the rub. Because I will always speak truth with you and be very practically and honest as I can. This won't come naturally at first. Hear me. It is a battle. That's why it's called a battle. <laughs> That's why there is this. That's why there is an enemy that wants to get your mind saturated with crud and things that have no business being in our mind. This will not come naturally at first, but if you begin to retrain your thoughts and just go through one, two, three, these gems of how we see this, this in Scripture, I promise it will pay huge dividends. Let me show you what I mean. 100 years ago, there was a, a great scientific survey that was done. Two neurologists got together, not neurotic people, two neurologists. They got together and they wanted to do some research. And the research they wanted to do was, how does the brain affect the body? How does how we think affect how we act, and how we are. This had never really been done on a detailed level. Now, this is the beautiful part. This was done a little over a century ago when women wore awesome hats. I mean, awesome hats, like this one right here. That is awesome. Look at that. Ladies, why y'all stopped wearing these? I will never know. <laughs> or this one here. Check this out. Wow. Look at the feathers. It's like, a, it's like a, a crow or something sitting on her forehead, like a bird. Or this one here is my favorite because it's like a cow. I mean, <laughs> you come walking in. That makes a sombrero look small. And she comes walking in. These things add a foot to your height or a foot on each side in your diameter. Okay? These are huge. These are, these are crazy hats. Now, here's, y'all, I'm telling you, this is, I am going somewhere so deep with this. You're going to love, love this. The researchers started to watch these ladies, 
and they watched how they interacted through the day. And they saw that the ladies who wore these every day had to duck going in and out of doorways. They had to duck or else, boom, <laughs> right? It would come off. Check this out. As they began to take notes and research this, and this went on for a period of weeks, these same ladies who were wearing these hats day by day, they asked them to take the hats off. Guess what the women did? They still ducked. When they went through a doorway, they instinctively ducked to go in a door. And then it dawned on these researchers. Their mental self was still wearing the hat, even though their physical self was not wearing the hat. Y'all, this is so incredibly deep. They, how they thought of themselves in their mind dictated how they walked in reality. It dictated, there's nothing on your hat. Can you imagine if I thought so much of myself, like, I'm going to go through this, oh, I, I better duck. I'm so massive and big and tall. And you'd be like, what are you doing, dude? What are you, 5'11", barely, six foot, right, right? I am six feet, and I claim that. Don't you laugh at that. I promise. Till I die, I am six feet. I'm the only Mitchell who has ever made it to six feet, and I'm claiming that as my birthright. As we go, as we go through this week, here's my challenge, okay? Ooh, let this in. This is so good. This is so deep. As we begin to reset our minds and our thoughts, as we begin to, to try to, to, to reset it, to focus on things that are pure, this is not going to come easy, and the devil will not sit by. I want to encourage you to give yourself some grace this week. If you accept this challenge, give yourself some grace because as you go through some of these doorways, as you try to reset your mind on things above, as you think, as Paul said, on things that are pure, as you try to reset your mind from self-defeating thoughts to thoughts of victory, as you go to reset your mind from thinking things that are hopeless to things that actually have hope and there's no more to spare, you will occasionally catch yourself still ducking to go through a doorway. You will. You will occasionally hear a whisper of the devil saying, that's not true. It's, not, it's really not going to work out. There really is no cause for hope. You probably should despair. You should think about that over and over. When the devil whispers those lies, when he tries to th give that, that, that foolish thought that you're still wearing the hat of condemnation, and he comes and he whispers this week, it's not, it's not, it's not a hope-filled thing. It's hopeless. What are you doing? Those reports that are coming from the doctor, you just know they're bad. You know, you know layoffs are coming. Why don't you just give in to it and wallow in that despair? When he tries to remind you that you're wearing a, a hat of guilt, or he whispers to you, you're, you're wearing a hat of condemnation or doubt or, or depression or misery or, or shame, when you hear those lies fly through your head and you instinctively drop your chin and you instinctively slouch those shoulders under the weight of that invisible hat, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that thought captive and you rebuke the devil. And you say, devil, I am done believing your lies. I am a child of the king. I am bought with the price. I am not my own. I am seated in the heavenlies. And I rebuke that. And I will take this thought captive and submit it unto the lordship of Christ. I immediately stop this. And you remember you no longer have that hat of shame on your head. You no longer wear that hat of condemnation. You encourage yourself. I want you to stand up tall. You square those shoulders, you raise that chin, and you claim what Paul promised when he said in Romans 12 too, you can renew your mind, literally transforming your mind, and let it be that holy shower. Let the light of the world light your path, and you claim that. Because when you think different thoughts, you become different people. I have seen this. I have seen some of you blossom in so many ways because God has got a hold of your heart. You've seen changes. You've seen it in your family. When you think different thoughts, when you remind yourself that you are a creation created in his image, you will be different, and it can't be hidden. Man, I want this reset. Don't you? If you want that reset, you can have it today, right now. Let's pray about it right now. Let's pray to the one who can meet these needs. Father, here we are. We are your children, and we, without shame, confess our dependence on you. We need you, Lord. We cry out to you. We ask for your presence, your power, and your wisdom and love. Help us have the mind of Christ. God, give us the, the hunger to think pure thoughts, noble thoughts. We want to embrace what you say about us, Lord. Help us to cast aside the opinions and the whispers of the devil, the opinions and thoughts of friends or coworkers that don't matter a hill of beans. What you think about us is what matters. And Lord, we claim that. Help us to leave the madness behind us. We receive your your healing and your beauty. 
We take every thought captive, Lord. We submit to your lordship. You are Lord over all, and we worship you. Reset our minds, God. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.